So if the social sciences, sociology, psychology can't with their scientific language of measurement address creativity, can't comprehend what Van Gogh's talking about when he talks about wings flying or death. How do we talk about creativity? And I'm gonna suggest it's poetic metaphor. So the thinkers most influential on me all speak metaphorically. Oswald Spengler writes, the means whereby we identify dead forms is mathematical law. The means whereby we understand living forms is metaphor. So Oswald Spengler, who is, let me get a laser pointer. Oswald Spengler, who's this one, wrote a book called The Decline of the West. In it, he looks at the underlying morphological structures of the major cultures and how they develop. But it's all metaphorical. In other words, they go through, cultures go through a birth, a youth, a maturity, an old age, and a death. Or go through, uses a seasonal and thought metaphor a spring, a summer, a fall, and a winter. Ananda Gumswari, an Indian philosopher, talks about mythology, studies Hindu and Buddhist thought, presents it for the West. And he realizes that all thought is metaphorical. It's over here. Joseph Campbell um, looks at mythology and sees <clears throat> the world religions not as belief systems in themselves, but as metaphors for universal human ideas or universal human experiences. And finally, Friedrich Nietzsche will look at right now as a beautiful metaphor essential to his thought. And I think it applies to creativity. So Nietzsche calls it the three metamorphoses. The three metamorphoses of the spirit. And it's a passage in Nietzsche's book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It was a painting of Nietzsche by Monk. And he begins by saying, of the three metamorphoses of the spirit, I tell you, how the spirit becomes a camel, and the camel a lion, and the lion finally a child. Now, <laughs> he's probably thinking about how we develop and mature. But I'm going to apply it directly to creativity. Oh, by the way, I have three illustrations here. Can anybody tell me the artists? Anybody? Um, I think that's um, Da Vinci's drawing. Is that? Very good. All three are laying out of Da Vinci. So the first one is the adoration of the Magi, where the three kings or wise men come on camels. The other one is a study of a baby. And I needed a lion fighting a dragon. And how do you like that? You have one. So Nietzsche begins, what is difficult? Asks the spirit that would bear much and kneels down like a camel waiting to be well loaded. Anybody have a thought of what Nietzsche means by <coughs> the spirit being a camel wanting to be loaded? 
Any thoughts what that might mean? How that might apply to you? Well, first step in becoming a mature person and certainly a creative person is to master your culture and your discipline. So you're gonna be an artist, graphic designer, filmmaker. You wanna know the history of art, graphic design, movies, and of your culture, to be a literate, acculturated person. You know who Picasso is. You know who Leonardo da Vinci is. You know who Mozart is. Be aware of your culture and well loaded is to have well mastered it. The camel then runs out into the desert and becomes a lion. In the loneliest desert, however, the second metaphor occurs. And here the spirit becomes a lion who would conquer his freedom and be master in his own desert. So the camel runs out into the desert, becomes a lion. If it was a well-loaded camel, it becomes a particularly potent lion. And conquer his freedom to establish his freedom, to be his own master. Now that's not gonna be easy, but let's stop for a minute and look at Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton University and then president of the United States. And he writes, it is the business of a university to impart the right thought of the world. Now, this is a much longer quote, but this makes the point. He's saying the job of the university is teach you how to properly understand and think about the world. Well, wait a minute. What about questioning? And if need be overthrowing the right thought of the world, who's to say what they tell you in school is whatever word, correct, the right way. First, you got to learn it, but not to then go on and imitate it, but to question it, only overthrowing it if necessary but certainly to be able to question it. That's the role of the lion. For ultimate victory, the lion wants to fight with the great dragon. Thou shalt is the name of the dragon, but the spirit of the lion says, I will. So anybody tell me what's the dragon? What does the dragon represent? The dragon is everything you've learned. What we've told you is the right way. How to think about the world, how to think about culture, how to think about your discipline. That's what Pratt's been telling you. That's the thou shalt. And Nietzsche says, the lion has to defeat that and say no. I see it differently. You don't have it right. I've got to assert who I am. I can't simply imitate my teachers. But it goes one step further. What can the child do that even the lion could not do? So the lion can only overthrow the now irrelevant past. The lion cannot create the new. Only the child can do that. The child is innocence and forgetting, a new beginning, a game, a wheel rolling out of its own center, the first movement, 
the sacred yes. So I like to use this slide. Tell me what we're looking at here. Anybody? What's the greatest science fiction movie of all time? Well, one of them is usually listed as Kubrick and Clark's 2001 of Space Odyssey. In the final scene shows the astronaut has been reborn as a fetus, the star child approaching and looking at the earth. And I superimposed on that a satellite from the movie, a wheel rolling out of its own center. This is how we thought space stations were gonna look. They may still. Anybody know why it's made this way? What's the big health problem that astronauts face if they spend a long time on the space station? Their bodies deteriorate from lack of gravity. So this kind of space station rotates. And in rotating, it throws you out the outer edge. So on the outer edge, it feels like you have gravity. Keep to your muscles in tone. So let's look in a little more detail. Mastery before creativity, the camel. So here are some greater figures I admire. And each of them overthrew entire traditions. But each of them, and we could find a hundred more, mastered the existing tradition before they did that. So in Beethoven's time, <clears throat> the dominant form was the Viennese symphony of Mozart and Haydn. And he mastered that. There's early Beethoven that sounds a lot like Mozart. If you don't know much about music like me, I can't tell the difference. But then he launched Romanticism, totally overthrowing that genre and that world. Then Margulies put forward a nice notion of symbiogenesis, that evolution takes place not through natural selection, but by microorganisms moving around whole genomes. So why is there cat DNA in people? Because some virus moved it over from your cat, from a cat to a person some time ago. So all of life is interconnected in a totally networked way. Then Margulies mastered Darwin, Darwinian evolution before overthrowing it with her own symbiogenesis. Thelonious Monk worked with the jazz greats to create bebop and then became Thelonious Monk entering his own world. Robert Venturi father of architectural postmodernism, in his book, Complexity and Contradiction, understands modern architecture better than his critics, even though he was the one that overthrew it. So, we're told Pratt claims to be teaching critical thinking. I want to question that. You can't think critically except about something. 
critical thinking about what. So critical thinking only comes after mastering the material of the culture. So there's been a lot of criticism of American education. That test scores have plummeted. Kids don't know anything. You ask through these late night comedy shows, they go out on the street and they ask a random intelligent looking pedestrian, who's the vice president? What are the three branches of government? Questions like that. And nobody has any idea. So how can you think critically if you don't know anything? This criticism of education, which starts to fall apart in the late 1960s. Um, one of the people pointing out the problems was E.D. Hirsch. In 1987, he wrote a book, Cultural Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know. And his critics hated the idea because they were being called out for undermining education. Now, should we teach people established, biased, out-of-date values? Or should we teach people how to think critically and create new values? Well, Hirsch's argument would be, you can't create new values until you understand what values are. That's step one. So this book was a fun read because it says, 5,000 names, phrases, dates, and concepts. And you could look in there and say, do I know that? Am I culturally literate? Well, this was such a success that a whole libraries have been created around this. So for parents who are not satisfied with what their kids are getting in school, there are books you can buy what your child should know in the second grade, or the math your child should know in the second grade, grammar your child should know in the second grade, third grade, fourth grade. And if the school won't do it, you can do it. So that's the camel. Now, there's a whole bunch of these books. One of them I enjoyed reading was Paul Copperman's Illiteracy Hoax, <clears throat> The Decline of Reading, Writing, and Learning in the Public Schools and What We Can Do About It. And he looks at how not only have test scores collapsed, but the tests have been made ridiculously easy. So apparently to pass Algebra in the New York Regents, in the New York High School, all you have to do is check box C for every question. You'll get randomly enough right answers to pass. That's how ridiculous the testing has become. And Copperman puts forward an interesting concept. Primary, secondary, and tertiary literacy. So primary literacy is the ability to read, write, and compute, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Secondary literacy is familiar with one's culture. Now we can debate what that is. Does it include Shakespeare? Should it include the Tao Te Ching? I think it should include both. The third one, tertiary literacy, is the ability to apply the first two to one's life and discipline. So this is 
of all the camel. Now, the same time that Hershey's book came out, Alan Bloom, a conservative cultural commentator, published a book, The Closing of the American Mind. This is a book about college. Our higher education has failed democracy and impoverished the souls of today's students. So, <clears throat> Bloom did, expected this to be an obscure book. And because of the timing, it was an explosive bestseller. Everybody was taking sides. His criticism is of relativism in academia. Friedrich Nietzsche, now, um, I don't agree with Bloom. I'm a relativist. So, but I do agree that we're not learning enough of the basics. Friedrich Nietzsche put forward the idea of moral relativism, that what your value, your moral values, depend on where you are in a culture. He refers to master morality and slave morality. If you're a slave, you're going to be careful about what you think and express in order to survive. Or to put it more up to date, if you have a visiting instructorship at Pratt without tenure, you're going to be careful what you say and what you do. You're going to have different values than somebody who has full time and tenure. So when I find myself disagreeing about something with a fellow faculty member, I say, oh, they're part time. They see this differently. So Bloom advocates for absolute values, but I don't know what those would be. But anyway, it, um, the book raised a lot of questions. So I see education as a framework. In four years at college or Pratt, you can't learn very much, but hopefully what you can do is get a framework that you can use to continue to add your experience throughout life. So when I lecture in history survey and architecture on Gothic, I only require one building, Chartres Cathedral. And I like to exaggerate by saying, you've seen one Gothic cathedral, you've seen them all. Now that's not true. If you're a medieval scholar, you know, there's all kinds of qualities of each of the major Gothic cathedrals. But if you understand Chartres Cathedral in depth, one example, then later in life when you're traveling, and you go to Notre Dame in Paris, Amiens, Reims. You'll know what you're looking at. You'll learn more, but you'll have a framework. Oh, that's the facade. That's the name. That's the transit. Those are the stained glass windows. They're different than Amiens from Sartre, but I understand what they are, what they're doing, why they're there. And I have a framework in which I can add more. So I like to say, if your education was cohesive, it came with a point of view. If it presented a framework, you will then have a framework into which you can weave what you'll do for the rest of your life.
But if you're interested, you know, some colleges are, I think, I shouldn't pick on anybody, but I think Brown University is 100% electives. Now, I think on one hand, that's great. I think, I don't think all universities should be the same. You should pick the one that works for you. But if your education is a series of randomly thrown together unrelated happenings, you'll have no coherent place to hang your ongoing experience. Your life will be in an unrelated jumble. Most colleges no longer have any vision of their purpose. So we must take charge of our own educations. If Pratt doesn't give you that framework, you're gonna to have to create it for yourself. Now, I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell. He's a uh, mythologist. His key book is The Earth with a Thousand Faces, <clears throat> which Lucas used as the basis for Star Wars. But he wrote numerous books looking at all the world's cultures. I see him as a good example of putting together your own education. Not that any of us should do what he did, but we should be inspired to do it for ourselves. So Campbell was studying medieval literature at Columbia University. In 1927, he went to Europe, Paris and Munich to continue his studies. Provençal, medieval French, medieval European languages. But while he was there, he discovered Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, Pablo Picasso and Paul Clay, James Joyce and Thomas Mann. In other words, modern art. These people were not known in the United States, or hardly known. And this is a revolution, a whole new approach to art, literature, and culture. And he was blown away. When he got back to Columbia, he said, I want to do a PhD that somehow incorporates this modern stuff with the medieval literature I've been studying. Columbia said, no, you can't do that. So he dropped out, never got a PhD. He went upstate New York, rented a cabin for $50 a year. It was the depression. And he was able to buy books on credit, got shipped up. And for nine hours a day for five years, he read. He wrote notes in the margin and he finished as he was writing each book, he would take about 20 pages of notes, which he would then condense to two pages with each book. As a result of that, he retained that material for the rest of his life. He read Spangler, who was all the rage at the time. And then he says, you know what? I think Spangler is dependent on Nietzsche. He read Nietzsche and he said, you know what? You can't understand Nietzsche without reading Schopenhauer. And then he said, well, you can't understand Schopenhauer unless you read Kant. And then he read Joyce, which led him to Jung and Freud. So he put together his own framework that led to is five volume Mass of God and Here with a Thousand Faces. He likes to say, mythology is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Now, again, no sociologist or psychologist could say that. 
secret opening, inexhaustible energies, cosmos. You can't measure those things. You can't even define them. So these are books that were big bestsellers a couple of years ago and are still current in the culture today. Does anybody have a tiger mother? Anybody? Anybody know what a tiger mother is? No play dates, homework seven days a week. Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell looks at exceptional people, but then he says, they're not born exceptional. It's accident and hard work that leads to success. I don't agree. There are just people who are exceptional. <clears throat> there's, scene, there's a scene in one of my favorite TV sitcoms, Big Bang Theory, in which Sheldon, who's a genius, is in a discussion, he says, well, for you, aren't all the prime numbers red and the double primes smell like gasoline? He just sees numbers in a different way. There are people to whom you can say, take 1,300,472, multiply it by 350,671, and they tell you the answer instantly. How do they do that? Well, some people have totally different ways of thinking. You might have heard of the 10,000 hours thing. <clears throat> it takes 10,000 hours to master a discipline. Well, that's true, but that's only mastery. That's, you be, that's a well-loaded camel. That's not a child creating a new world. And this was a big bestseller. Angela Duckworth, great. The power of perseverance. Now, a psychological study show the people who stick to it are more successful. Well, that should be obvious. Again, it doesn't mean that they come up with new insights. So, that's some comments on our culture today. <laughs> we don't provide the basics. And then when we do advocate hard work, it's only to become a well-loaded camel. We're not encouraged to overthrow the culture. Finally, people are most creative when they're young. And we make sure that when you're young, you can't do anything. So when are they going to let you start doing something? For example, suppose you wanted to teach musical composition. Well, you would need a PhD to get a job in a university. That might be by your late 30s. You might be 40 years old before you finish your PhD, and you can start on the academic ladder. Well, Chopin died at 39. Gershwin died at 38. Bizet at 37. Mozart at 35. Schubert at 31. And does anybody know what the 27 club is? Kurt Cobain, Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, and Amy Whitehouse, among the dozens of rock stars who died at the age of 27. And then I say, think of what they could have accomplished if they had lived long enough to have finished graduate school. And that comment is meant to be sarcastic. Graduate school has nothing to do with it. In writing, Sylvia Plath, and Emily Bronte died at 30, Stephen Crane and Shelley at 29, 
and John Keats at 25, my favorite. Arthur Rambeau died at 37, but he stopped writing at 21, leaving Europe to become a gun runner. None of them had a PhD. In physics, again, you're not allowed to do anything till you have a PhD. Then you have to do postdoc, and then you get a, um, <clears throat> a junior academic appointment. You might be 40 before anybody will take you seriously. But Isaac Newton came up with his law of gravity at 23. Einstein did his theory of relativity at 26. And Niels Bohr did his theory of the atom at 27. And George Gamow, who observes this himself, published his work on how stars make their energy at 24. So people make fundamental breakthroughs when they're young, but young people are no longer allowed to participate. So we haven't had any breakthroughs in physics in 30 years. It's dead ended. And then we all know that Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard, but there are dozens of them. Bill Gates of Microsoft dropped out of college, Steve Jobs of Apple, Larry Ellison of Oracle, Michael Dell of Dell, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, Jimmy Jack Dorsey of Twitter, and Sergey Brin and Larry Page finished college but dropped out of graduate school to found Google. One of my favorites, David Karp, didn't drop out of college. He didn't even finish high school. He was going to Bronx Science and was bored out of his mind and hated it. His mother saw that he was, didn't like school and said, okay, you can drop out. He founded um, Tumblr, sold it for a billion dollars. In an earlier generation, Edwin Land, a developer of the Polaroid instant camera, dropped out of Harvard, came to New York, and he'd sneak into the Columbia University laboratories at night to do his research. So I'm going to. Um, skip the above paragraph and look at the uh, bottom one. It's not necessary that schools are teaching the wrong thing, but they crowd out the opportunity for something else, actually doing what one aspires to do. Finally, there's a stage in Nietzsche's parable of the camel, the lion, the dragon, and the child, it leaves out something I think is important, which is a long tone. Who are we looking at? Anybody? Unmute and tell us. J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter. She read the Mordaunt and the Once and Future King, and then sat in for two years in a pub writing her book. How do you know how to prepare for your what you're going to do, Steve Jobs? If you want to read something brilliant, <clears throat> just go on Google and look up Steve Jobs Stanford Address. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Steve Jobs went to, now I'm not remembering it, so a cool college, but he dropped out and he was no longer in the dorm, so he slept in the library stacks and he sat in on classes and he took a calligraphy class. Beautiful lettering. When he made the Macintosh, he insisted that 
did not have computer type, but it could have actual fonts. Helvetica, Times, Serif, Sans Serif. To do that, it needed graphic capability. That really overwhelmed the computer of the day. Today, it's easy, but it had so little memory and so little processing power that it was difficult for the computer to do that. It really crippled the Macintosh and it didn't do well compared to the IBM PC, which really took over from Apple. And Apple's only had 10% of the market ever since, but he needed, he needed to give the, the Mac computer graphics capability. So today, on a Mac or Windows, you have icons, graphics, images. You can watch movies. It's all because Steve Jobs took a calligraphy class. So looking forward, you can see that's where it came. Looking back, you can see where that came from. When he took the calligraphy class, he had no idea what it was going to mean. So J.K. Rowling was able to sit in a pub and uh, <laughs> the pub advertises birthplace of Harry Potter. Sit in there and do her writing with a long time. So Isaac Newton was able to, well, had to leave London because of the plague. He spent two years in a small town back at home. And that's where he came up with all of his laws of optics, gravity, and uh, laws of motion. Albert Einstein worked in a patent office. He was able to get his work done in two hours in the morning, spend the rest of the time working on his physics. He was so good, they offered to promote him. But he turned the promotion down so he could have the time to do his own work. Bucky Fuller, who created the geodetic dome, his daughter died. He was young. He was so grieved that he didn't talk for a full year. And during that time came up with the idea, what can one person do to change the world? And his idea was how to do more with less. And J.K. Rowling came up with Harry Potter while well, it came to her in a railroad station when the train was delayed two hours. But she um, then developed it in her, with her a long time. <laughs>